a CNN special report, Columbia, a shuttle tragedy. From the CNN Global Headquarters in Atlanta, here's Anderson Cooper. Good evening, everyone. 35 hours after we lost, last saw Columbia streak across a clear blue Texas sky, the search for debris continues. Just about two or three hours ago, NASA telling us remains of all seven Columbia astronauts have been found. But the search for debris spread over two states continues, and one has to wonder if all of it will ever be recovered. Tonight, we have a lot to cover. Joining me for our special uh, report this next hour, CNN's Miles O'Brien. He is reporting live from Johnson Space Center in Houston. We will check in with Miles in just a moment. But first, let's get an update on the latest developments. For that, we turn to Carol Lynn. Thanks, Anderson. Well, without offering any firm conclusions, NASA officials have a somewhat clearer picture about the shuttle tragedy. They say Columbia's computers adjusted the flight altitude just before the orbiter broke apart. The change was prompted by increased drag on the vehicle, accompanied by a sharp increase in the temperature in the fuselage. NASA also says remains of all seven crew members have been found. Israel's ambassador to the U.S. says Ilan Ramon's family is especially anxious to have his remains returned to Israel for a Jewish burial. Ramon's widow says their five-year-old daughter may have actually had a premonition about the disaster. When the shuttle blasted off 17 days ago, the little girl said, I lost my daddy. And people across America and around the world have been creating spontaneous memorials to the Columbia astronauts. NASA is holding an official memorial on Tuesday in Houston. President and Mrs. Bush are expected to attend, Anderson. That is the latest that we've got there. Carol, thanks very much. We'll check back with you shortly. Uh, about 5 o'clock Eastern time today at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. There was a press conference. lasted for about an hour and a half. NASA officials talking, going into a lot of details about what they know, what they don't know, and what they want to find out. Miles O'Brien was at the press conference. He joins us now with details. Miles? Anderson, it's a story of uh, raw emotion and also some raw numbers. And we got a lot of that today as Ron Didimore, the shuttle program manager, and Bob Cabana, flight crew operations director here, uh, spent uh, quite a bit of time laying out uh, what they know so far, technically speaking, about the final minutes of Columbia's flight and a little bit about the beginning of the flight. We'll talk about that in a minute, but first, basically to boil down what they said when they gave us that timeline of the last five minutes, you had a combination of two things happening. As Columbia came in, temperature sensors inside the left wheel well we're indicating a significant spike as well as temperature sensors here on the left uh, wall of the fuselage and at the same time some sensors that were in this flap at the trailing edge of the wing went silent it just so happens their cables went right through that wheel well at the same time it was trying to pull to the left the orbiter's autopilot was trying to compensate trimming it back fighting that tendency to pull left all of that we're told is consistent with a problem with the tiles underneath, either rough tiles or perhaps some missing tiles. Joining me now to uh, hash out a little bit of the technicalities here is Norm Thaggard, veteran shuttle astronaut, a man who joined the Astronaut Corps in 1978, the first crew of astronauts selected specifically for the shuttle. Uh, Norm, uh, I don't want to get too far down the road here because that is definitely a bit of speculation that we have there, but everything we've said there is consistent with a body of fact. That's exactly right, and I think what Ron Denimore said this afternoon is he feels like probably anyone hearing that information would feel that's what it leads you to, but it's still too early to say that this or that is the cause because the situation is still fluid. All right, so do you feel fairly confident that uh, no matter what the cause of that potential tile problem might have been, that that, it, that is perhaps what it can best explain what we have seen from those uh, flight data recorders or the, actually the flight uh, data which is in the computers here in Houston of the last five minutes of Columbia. Well, I would say that because in science you build a hypothesis that's consistent with the, all the observations and that one certainly is. All right, which brings us to the beginning of this mission 17 days ago. And uh, we've been talking a fair amount about this and this is where we need to be very careful about the speculation because 80 seconds after Columbia launched from uh, the launch pad there at the Kennedy Space Center, uh, there was a piece of debris from the orange uh, external fuel tank, which I'll, I'll reassemble the shuttle stack here for just a moment. We'll look at the uh, analytical graphics animation to give you a sense of what happened. 
as the shuttle rose, building up uh, speed and uh, the pressure increasing on it, uh, some object fell off that orange external fuel tank, which feeds fuel into the main engines of this orbiter uh, as it rises toward orbit. And that object, whether it was a piece of that orange foam which insulates that tank, or perhaps some ice, or maybe a combination of both, definitely struck the left underside of that wing. All right, let's uh, take it from there, Norm. How far do we go with that before we're getting deep into speculation? Well, that is speculation because we lose this foam material on every flight. I've seen it certainly on the flights on which I was up on the flight deck. It almost looks like snow at times, and the most it does is streak the wings. It does do minor damage to the tiles, but it wouldn't appear that that kind of material could do the sort of damage that would seem to have to happen to cause this accident. NASA astronauts, anybody who's flown a shuttle has seen this stuff fall off. So if you're up on the flight deck, you'll see it. All right, so when engineers were pouring over the film that they looked at the day or so after launch and, and discovered this, it would, number one, be not unusual to see the foam fall off, and number two, uh, based on what they've learned over 112 previous flights, it would also not be uh, way off the mark to uh, conclude that that foam wouldn't cause much damage. I think that's what you would conclude, and looking at the picture of it, it was white exactly like that foam material appears to be when it comes off on this shuttle. All right, and finally, one other point here, which is uh, perhaps more to the point than anything. Even if there was a tremendous amount of damage caused by that foam or ice or whatever it was, uh, w there really is uh, nothing that the crew or anybody here at Mission Control could have done. Is that correct? That's pretty much correct, and it's one of those situations where if you're the crew, maybe it's even better not to know that, because even knowing it, what do you do about it? Yeah, all right. Norm Thagger, thank you very much for your insights. Uh, it's uh, interesting to think that 80 seconds after this 16-day mission began, the crew might very well uh, have been doomed. Well, we will uh, be following that very closely and, and looking at other possibilities, trying not to get the blinders on. Certainly NASA here is not trying to focus on any one thing for fear, as Ron Didamore put, put it just a little while ago, of missing something uh, very important. Now, this was an in-flight breakup that is unprecedented in aviation and space history, traveling uh, 18 times the speed of sound, uh, some 40 miles above the surface of the, the planet, uh, the Space Shuttle Columbia broke up and rained down debris all over uh, the continent of the United States, Texas and Louisiana and New Mexico. Uh, but primarily the focus of much of the debris field is uh, in the area of Nagadocious, Texas. And that's where we find CNN's Ed Lavendera this evening. Ed? Hi, Miles. Well, officials here in Nacogdoches have put out a preliminary map that they've used a uh, GPS technology to kind of pinpoint just what how much area they have to cover. And it has pretty much taken up the entire county. That is how much uh, work they have ahead of them in the weeks ahead. They've already had uh, 1,200 confirmed uh, sightings and locations of debris found in Nacogdoches County. And that is uh, important because right now officials here are saying they've essentially pretty much run out of manpower as they await for federal officials to tell them with what they need to do with what has already been found on the ground. So they're hoping they're, they can begin processing and moving what's already on the ground so they can get th those officials and that manpower onto the other debris that is still laying around the county. 1,200 pieces of debris in Nacogdoches County alone. We understand that today they were able to find a, a portion of the crew cabin, a portion of a tire, as well as portion of a harness. And there were also uh, three confirmed uh, locations where human remains were found here in the Nacogdoches area as well. So much work ahead of them. And also one of the things that is now kind of uh, slowing things down is that uh, the, many of the much of the debris or several several locations debris has fallen around uh, schools and the, now there is concern that schools won't be able to open tomorrow unless that material is removed you know, the decision will be left up to the school districts as to determine whether or not they should open tomorrow but EPA crews have been given a preliminary go ahead to be able to go into these school areas and try to move that uh, material out so that school can resume tomorrow we do have FEMA collection teams that have arrived in Nacogdoches County that are going to uh, place our public schools uh, and private schools on a top priority for collection. As it stands right now, those are the only approved sites uh, for retrieval of any type of debris. Uh, anything else beyond that will come on a case-by-case -case basis. Miles officials here say that there are 25 
uh, calls coming in an hour with reports of new debris being found in the area. Hmm. Officials here will use GPS technology to mark each one of these debris sp uh, spots. And I think in a few weeks, perhaps even months, they will be able to put out a, a map of the entire East Texas area that will be able to pinpoint just how massive an area these folks have had to search through. Miles? Mm. I know they're anxious to get that debris removed. It's a lot of manpower involved in all that, Ed Lavadera.